Man, the title of my sermon tonight is Jesus in the Book of Exodus. Jesus in the Book of Exodus. You know, this morning I preached about Jesus in the Book of Genesis, and I talked about how it's not just Genesis, but that other books of the Bible are the same way. So I wasn't just blowing smoke at you. Actually, Exodus is the same way. So I want to talk about Jesus in the book of Exodus. Of course, the Bible tells us to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And so all throughout the Old Testament books, they're constantly pointing us to Jesus Christ. There are literal appearances of Jesus Christ as well as symbolism regarding Jesus Christ or prophecies of Jesus. And we see a lot of that in the book of Exodus. Even right in the very first chapter of Exodus. Turn back if you would to Exodus chapter number 1. Second book in the Bible is Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter number 1. And in the first book, we see that the children of Israel, they went down into Egypt and they were only 70 souls that went down there with Israel in that first generation. But over the course of hundreds of years, they multiplied and grew and became a great nation in Egypt. And when they were down there multiplying, the Egyptians began to get nervous. And they said, you know, behold, the people of the children of Israel is more and mightier than we. And they were afraid that they would turn on them or side with their enemies or something like that. So they put them into bondage and they afflict them. But then the Bible says the more that they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And so they ended up doing something horrible where they wanted to kill all of the male children that were born unto the Hebrews. Look down, if you would, at Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. It says, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. And what could be more grotesque or wicked than taking a newborn baby and throwing it in the river? I mean, can you imagine just destroying the life of a newborn baby? But even today in the United States of America, this is considered normal because New York just passed a law and there's a video or an image of all the lawmakers just smiling and all the men in their little faggoty pink tie, you know, for women's rights or feminism or whatever stupidity they have a pink tie on about, oh, isn't it so wonderful that now in the state of New York, you can murder a baby all the way up until it's born. I mean, think about it. How many times are babies born prematurely and they're fine? You know, they're born at 36 weeks, 37 weeks, 38 weeks, and they're born, they're fine. But you could have a baby that's 40 weeks inside its mother's womb and it could be legally murdered in the state of New York. And I'm sure other states are going to follow suit. I'm sure Vermont and Massachusetts will be next in that part of the country of just allowing these horrific late-term abortions. But you know what? All abortions, wicked. I don't care how many weeks. I don't care if it's early term, midterm, late-term abortions. It's murder. It's infanticide. It's disgusting. And isn't it funny that these atheists who claim to care so much about science and they just they just believe in the evidence and the science and the evolution and the Big Bang and everything like that? Isn't it amazing how they'll turn around and look at a baby in its mother's womb and say it's not alive, even though that defies every scientific definition of life? By any scientific definition, it's alive, and we know it's human. It's not like it starts out as an animal. And then it becomes a human when it's born. Actually, if it were an animal, they'd probably be more likely to want to keep it alive. It seems like these bunch of libtards are more interested in keeping animals alive than human beings. It's disgusting. But you know what? There's nothing new under the sun. I mean, the Egyptians were throwing babies into the river. There were people in the Old Testament who offered their sons and their daughters in sacrifice unto Molech, and they cast their children in the fire. Babies being cast in the river. Hey, mankind is wicked. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And mankind has always been wicked. And so this kind of garbage has always gone on. And the United States is getting to that point now where it's resembling these Old Testament bad example nations that were so wicked that they actually murdered their own children. But what does this have to do with Jesus in the book of Exodus? I'll tell you what, because the same thing happened to baby Jesus. He was threatened with what? With murder. Because when he was just approximately a two-year-old boy, Herod sent out that decree 
to murder all the children in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. And so just as baby Moses was in peril of being destroyed just by virtue of being born, it's the same thing with baby Jesus, right? So that's why Moses had to be hidden of his parents. By the, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So they hid baby Moses for three months and then they couldn't hide him anymore. They put him in the ark. They put him in a boat. And you know the story. But the point is that Jesus is being foreshadowed in the story of baby Jesus right here in Exodus chapter 1. Of course, then in chapter 2, Moses grows up. And when he reaches 40 years old, he refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chooses rather to suffer, suffer affliction with the people of God. He ends up killing the Egyptian. And then he ends up fleeing into the desert, into the land of Midian. And he's dwelling there when the Lord comes and speaks to him 40 years later. And when the Lord comes and speaks to Moses, when he's an 80-year-old man, he speaks to him in the burning bush. Now go to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. So we saw in chapter 1 the imagery and the symbolism of baby Moses representing baby Jesus, right? They're both in peril of these infanticidal governments. Look at Exodus chapter number 3 in verse 2. The Bible reads, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, that's Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, this vision of the burning bush and the Lord speaking to him, out of the burning bush. This is Jesus in the book of Exodus. Let me prove it to you. This is Jesus in the book of Exodus. First of all, the Bible says in verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And often in the Old Testament, the Bible calls Jesus the angel of the Lord. Now, when the Bible says the angel of the Lord, it's not always referring to Jesus because it could be referring to another of the Lord's messengers because the word angel simply means messenger. But Jesus is called the messenger of the covenant in Malachi chapter number three when it prophesies how he will suddenly come into his temple and he's going to purge the temple. Remember when he flipped over the tables and chased out the money changers? That prophecy in Malachi 3 calls Jesus the messenger of the covenant. There are multiple times in the Old Testament where you can prove that the angel of the Lord in that situation is referring to Jesus. And this is one of those situations because the angel of the Lord here that speaks unto him out of the bush is also called God because it says God called unto him out of the bush. And not only that, but flip over to Joshua chapter 5. Keep your finger there in Exodus chapter 3. Let's go to Joshua 5. And I'm trying to show you that... Who God, I'm trying to show you that the one with whom Moses spake in the burning bush was actually Jesus, okay, that he was speaking to in that burning bush. Go, if you would, to Joshua chapter number 5, verse 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man. Remember back in Genesis, the man who wrestled with Jacob, right? And it turned out to be God that he wrestled with. It says, he saw and there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, art thou for us or for our adversaries? So he's by Jericho and this guy is just holding a naked sword, right? So that seems a little bit aggressive, right? When somebody's just got the, the sword drawn. So he says, hey, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Are you for our adversaries? And I love the answer 
And he said, nay. Now that was not a yes or no question, but he answers him, no. So are you for us or are you for our enemies? No. All right. Because he's neither. He says, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. He's saying, basically, I'm not for you. You're for me. All right. I'm the leader here. I'm the boss. I'm not following you. You're following me. I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joseph, or uh, excuse me, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Notice this man receives worship from Joshua. When Joshua worships him, he doesn't correct him. On the contrary, he says to him, Put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. That's exactly what the angel of the Lord said from the burning bush. The angel of the Lord told him to take off his shoes because he's on holy ground. This man says the exact same thing. He's the captain of the Lord's host and he receives worship. Now, if you remember John in the book of Revelation, he falls down at the feet of the angel who's showing him things and the angel corrects him and says, See thou do it not, for I am of thy fellow servants and uh, I am thy fellow servant of thy brother and the prophet which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So he's telling him, don't worship me, worship God. But do we see this man saying, don't worship me, worship God? No, we see this man receiving the worship and in fact demanding even more obeisance, demanding that he remove his shoes as a further sign of deference, as a further sign of reverence and worship. So this is clearly no ordinary man and this is clearly just not some run-of-the-mill angel. No, this is Jesus. Okay, Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. Jesus is the one who answered Moses out of the burning bush and told him to remove his shoes. And now as Moses is replaced by Joshua, he appears to Joshua and tells him to remove his shoes and he receives the worship that is due unto only the Lord, right? Because we should worship the Lord our God and him only shall we serve. Go to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. And isn't it amazing that in all these Old Testament appearances of Jesus, he's a man, right? Like the man who wrestled with Jacob. And then Jacob said, I've seen the face of God. Or the three men walk up to Abraham in the heat of the day, and one of them's the Lord, and the other two are his two angels. So you know what? That proves that Jesus was a man in the Old Testament. Jesus was a human being. He was a man back then. Why? Because he is eternally the Son of God. He is eternally a man. He is that uh, member of the Godhead who is man, right? He is the Son of God, eternally, eternal Son of God, and he did not just come into existence in the New Testament. And this is what these oneness Pentecostals and modalists teach. They say, oh, well, there's no Son of God in the Old Testament because God hadn't fathered a son yet. That's Luke chapter 1 where that's talked about, or Luke chapter 2, or Matthew chapter 1. Wrong. The Son of God already existed in the Old Testament as a man that makes numerous appearances where people see God face to face. Go to Exodus 23 there and look at verse number 20. This is when Moses is up on the mount getting the laws from God. And it says in Exodus 23, 20, Behold, I send an angel before thee, to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Okay, so this is the man whom Joshua is confronted with in Joshua chapter 5. This is that angel that's going to go before them and lead them into the promised land. And it says, my name is in him. Okay, this is further proof of his deity, his divinity. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, verse 22, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites the Hivites and the Jebusites, 
and I will cut them off. And you see, this is why when it talks about the children of Israel being in the wilderness, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 10 that they provoked Christ. They provoked that angel that went before them. Now you say, are you saying Jesus is an angel? No, angel means messenger. Just like in Revelation 2 and 3 when he says the angel of the church of Ephesus, the angel of the church of Smyrna. We're not talking about the angelic beings like seraphims and cherubims. We're talking about a messenger and Jesus Christ is called the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And multiple times in the Old Testament, he is called the angel of the Lord. And he's being worshipped and he's called God and the Lord and everything else. So with that in mind, go back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. What's the sermon about? Jesus in the book of Exodus. We saw the foreshadowing in chapter 1 of the baby Jesus being persecuted and they sought to kill him, right? Then when we get to chapter 3, we see the Lord speak to Moses out of the burning bush and we find that specifically the one speaking to Moses out of the burning bush is Jesus. It's actually the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, making an Old Testament appearance. Same as Joshua 5 is Jesus making an Old Testament appearance. Same as Exodus chapter 23 is mentioning that Jesus will go before them. Look, if you would, at verse number 13 of Exodus chapter 3. And Moses said unto God, so notice when he answers back the angel of the Lord from the burning bush, he's talking to who? He's talking to God. Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, thou sh Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And of course, that name is significant, I am. I am that I am. Remember when they said to Jesus, Thou art not fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And that's when they took up stones to stone him because he's claiming to be deity by saying, before Abraham was, I am. Then he also makes the seven great I am statements in the book of John. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I am the true vine. I'm the good shepherd. I am the door. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, right? These seven great I am statements of Jesus in the book of John, identifying him as Jehovah, right? Now, if you would flip over to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. For sake of time, we're going to jump forward to Exodus 12. But let me just refresh your memory that in between Moses meeting God at the burning bush in Exodus 12, he goes and confronts Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And when he confronts Pharaoh, of course, Pharaoh hardens his heart and refuses to let the people go. Then, subsequently, God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that he just will not back down. And there are ten plagues that are brought upon Egypt. Well, of course, those ten plagues, as I taught this morning, are a foreshadowing of the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, where many of the same plagues or similar plagues will be brought not just on Egypt, but on the entire world at that time. So there's more of Jesus in the book of, of Exodus because the plagues are picturing the wrath of Jesus, the wrath of the Lamb, as it states in Revelation chapter 6. But Exodus chapter 12 is probably the most powerful picture of Jesus in the book of Exodus because it's about the Passover. And the Bible tells in 1 Corinthians 5 that Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So look down at verse number 1 of Exodus chapter 12. The Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls, 
Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Here's an interesting progression here. It starts out being a lamb, then it becomes the lamb, and then ultimately it is your lamb, right? So we need to have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, right? That's what you'll even uh, hear that terminology a lot. You know, he needs to be your Savior. He needs to be your lamb, right? You need to have him personally as your Savior. So the Bible says in verse number five, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Of course, Jesus is the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the reason the lamb had to be without blemish is to picture the fact that Jesus Christ is totally sinless. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. It says, ye shall keep it, verse number six, until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, what's interesting is that they take the lamb on the 10th day of the month, and they keep it until the 14th. And the reason is to examine it and make sure that it's without blemish, just to kind of keep an eye on it and have it there under observation, make sure it's a good, healthy lamb. And then on the 14th, they kill it. Now, this is like Jesus Christ on that Sunday that we know as Palm Sunday, where he does the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and they lay down the palm branches and the coats and Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That was on the 10th day of the first month that that happened, the 10th day of the month, Abib. That was the presentation of the lamb right there where he's being presented. And then just a few days later on the 14th day of the month, Abib, he was killed by whom? Well, it says here that the Passover was to be killed by the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. Well, you know what? That's who killed Jesus. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. They assembled together and the Roman governor wanted to let Jesus go. He said three times, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. Three times to signify what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Just to show that he was without spot and without blemish. He was examined and found to be guiltless, but the Jews cried out anyway, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Oh, I'm free from the blood of this just person, Pilate said, and washed his hands. And they said, his blood be on us and on our children. That's why all throughout the book of Acts, the Jews are constantly accused, you with wicked hands took Jesus and hanged him on a tree. You slew the Prince of Life. You slew Jesus. And then the Apostle Paul picks it up again in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when he says the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. So all throughout Acts and again in 1 Corinthians 2, the Bible says the Jews killed Jesus. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. Because the prophecy is that the Passover would be killed by the congregation. They all gathered together and screamed, crucify him. Now, sure, it was some random Roman soldier that actually drove the nails into his hands. But that's not who killed Jesus, according to the Bible. The Bible says the Jews killed Jesus, right? Because they were the ones who delivered him up. And that's why Jesus said to Pilate, when Pilate got all pompous and said, Knowest thou not that I have power to release thee or have power to destroy thee? Jesus said, Thou wouldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from heaven. Therefore, he that delivered me unto you has the greater sin. Jesus looked right at Pilate and said, The one who delivered me unto you hath the greater sin. It was the Jews who delivered up Jesus to be crucified, who screamed, Crucify him. The Bible says that Pilate had a sin, obviously, by being involved. Washing his hands isn't good enough. Pilate was guilty. The Romans were guilty, but you know who was more guilty? The Jews. They had the greater sin, the Bible says. So here we see that prophecy. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper doorpost of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. So we see that 
the blood is put at the top and on the two side posts. If you connect the dots, what do you get? A cross symbol, right? The two side posts on the top, it forms a cross. That's what's being symbolized there. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. So they take the blood, they put it on the house wherein they eat. And the Bible says in verse 8, They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. Sodden means boiled, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. Notice what a big deal it makes about eating it roast with fire. Verse 8 says, eat it roast with fire. And verse 9 says, not raw, not boiled. It has to be cooked a certain way. Roast with fire. Why is that? That is to picture the fact that Jesus Christ was spent three days and three nights in hell. His soul was made an offering for sin, as Isaiah 53 says. The Bible says that this spake he of the resurrection of Christ, Acts 2.31, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. And he cried out from hell and said, My soul shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The Bible says that Jesus Christ descended first into the lower parts of the earth, right? Before he ascended up to God on high. So he died, and the Bible says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It says he descended into the lower parts of the earth. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it for you from Ephesians chapter 4. It says... Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all things, or I'm sorry, far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So the Bible's pretty clear that Jesus descended into hell for three days and three nights. His soul was not left in hell. He rose again. That's why when he rose again, he said, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Another great scripture on this is Romans chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, but it says, For the, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Watch this. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. So to bring up Christ again from the dead would be to descend into the deep. You know what the deep is? The lower parts of the earth. And this is the same thing where the demons cried out to Jesus. They didn't want to be cast into the deep. Don't send us to the deep. Don't send us to that bottomless pit, right? Don't send us into the abyss is what they're saying. Don't send us down there yet, okay? So Jesus Christ spent three days and three nights in hell, and then up from the grave he arose. His soul was not left in hell, neither did his body see corruption. So his soul came up out of hell, came back into his body, and he walked out of the grave and showed him the holes in his hands and the hole in his side. The body without the spirit is dead, right? So when Jesus died, it was just a body there. The soul went down into hell after Jesus gave up the ghost, okay? So we see that in Exodus 12 as well. They're roasting with fire, picturing the fact that Jesus would be uh, in hell for three days and three nights. You say, well, I don't think he went to hell. I think he just went to Hades. He just went to Sheol. Well, if you're going to believe that, you'd have to say that the King James Bible's wrong then because right. the King James Bible says that he was in hell for three days and three nights. And you'd also have to say that a whole bunch of other Bibles and a whole bunch of other languages are wrong because the majority of Bibles throughout history in, in most languages have translated that as hell. And in fact, that Greek word Hades, and they say, well, it wasn't hell, it's just Hades, right? Okay, well, the Bible says in Hades, the rich man lift up his eyes in torments and he's on fire. Every single time the Bible says hell, 54 times, it's always a bad place. And it doesn't matter whether you look up the Greek words Hades and Gehenna, guess what? It's always a bad place. It's always fire. It's always punishment. Well, there's a good side of hell. 
Yeah, right. Well, paradise, or, you know. Folks, paradise is in heaven. Amen. It said, it said in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was caught up to paradise. Paradise is up. Hell is down. Two totally different places, friend. And so this whole Abraham's bosom paradise doctrine is a false doctrine. Hell is hell is hell is hell, okay? And so your King James Bible is right. Don't let these people take you back to the Greek, to Hades, and try to show you Homer's Iliad or something to try to tell you where Jesus went for three days and three nights, okay? Because of the fact that it's the same Greek word in Luke 16 where he's burning in hell as thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It's the same English word, same Greek word, same place. And it's fire. Well, it had two compartments. Okay, just go take the Talmud and the Mishnah and all that garbage and hang all that because I don't believe any of that. I believe in heaven and hell, okay? And so this, that, anyway, that's a whole nother sermon. And by the way, if Jesus was in paradise for three days and three nights, here's my question. Why is he so anxious to get out of there? You know, I've been to paradise a few times and I wanted to stay as long as I could. When you're at paradise, when you're laying on a beach somewhere in paradise, you're not saying, well, there's hope because you're not going to leave me here. I, I just don't want to be stuck here in Maui. You know, oh, you know, my only hope is that I'm not going to be stuck here in Baja, California. You know, I could get out of this horrible paradise beach front property. No, paradise isn't a place that you're dying to get out of. But Jesus clearly is saying, hey, my hope is that I'm getting out of hell that my soul's not going to be left in hell, right? So anyway, I, I don't want to go on and on about that. There's more to talk about tonight. But anyway, let's go back here in Exodus 12. It says, You shall let nothing of it, verse 10, remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So when we see the Passover here and the, the angel coming through and smiting all the firstborn and killing them, the only way to survive was to be inside the house that has the blood on the doorpost. Well, throughout the Bible, the house is often a symbol of our bodies. The Bible calls our body the temple of the Holy Ghost. And uh, the Apostle Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, we know that if this, the, our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that we have a building in the heavens, right? So he's saying, look, uh, the house of this earthly tabernacle, and he's talking about his physical body. So the blood on the doorpost represents basically the blood applied to the doorpost of our hearts, right? We have the blood of Christ applied in our hearts spiritually that's what saves us. So the Passover pictures salvation. The lamb dies and then the blood is applied and that's how you're saved. But if you don't have the blood applied to the doorpost of your heart, you're not saved. The fact that Jesus died for you doesn't get you automatically to heaven. He's got to be your lamb and the blood has to be applied to your doorpost spiritually. So when they go through this event with the Passover, the ones who are in the house with the blood applied, they are spared the death of their firstborn, right? They're spared that judgment. Flip over, if you would, to Exodus chapter 14. So the next thing that happens after the blood is applied, after they make it through the Passover, is that they leave Egypt. And when they leave Egypt, they end up crossing the Red Sea, right? To get out of Egypt and to go into Mount Sinai in Arabia. And the Bible says in verse number 29 of chapter 14, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land, excuse me, in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Now keep your finger there in Exodus 14. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
So, of course, the Passover lamb pictures Christ, but the crossing of the Red Sea pictures baptism, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, chapter 10, verse 1, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So there was a cloud there that represented God's presence. And when they passed through the Red Sea on dry land, the Bible told us that they had a wall of water on the right and on the left. So on both sides, they had a wall of water. And the Bible tells us that they were under a cloud, right? What is a cloud made out of? Water. So they were under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. This pictures baptism. Look at verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Do you see that? So because they were surrounded by water, that's a picture of baptism where you're dunked under water, where you're surrounded by water on all sides and above. That's immersion in the waters of baptism. So they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? What was the spiritual meat that they ate? Well, a little bit later in the story in Exodus, as they wander in the wilderness, God feeds them with what? Manna, manna right? They receive manna every morning and they gather it from the ground. They all ate the same spiritual meat and they all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now, isn't it interesting that the rock was a spiritual rock and that spiritual rock followed them. Meaning that that spiritual rock did not stay in one place. It wasn't one location where they went to the rock and Moses smote the rock and water came out. You remember that in Exodus? He smites the rock, water comes out. That rock was a spiritual rock. That rock followed them. And the Bible says at the end of verse 4, something quite astounding, that rock was Christ. Okay, so we see here that Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. The Bible says, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, that is Christ Jesus. He's the rock, he's the foundation, and so that rock symbolized Jesus Christ. So when he smote the rock and water came out, that has to do with where the Bible said, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That was a prophecy of Jesus being crucified, and the wording was, quote, smite the shepherd. Well, smiting the rock caused what? Living waters to come out. And this is a picture of the fact that when Jesus Christ would die for us, when he would be smitten, the living water of salvation would be made available to all. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So is it just me, or do... Parallels with Jesus abound in the book of Exodus. It's just like, it's another Genesis, folks. I mean, think about it. Right away in chapter 1, we see a foreshadowing of baby Jesus being persecuted and, and how Herod would seek to kill baby Jesus. Then right away, we have Jesus speaking to Moses in chapters 3 and 4 out of the burning bush. Then we have the story of the plagues, which is a picture of Jesus returning in the book of Revelation, and pouring out the wrath of the Lamb. Then we get into the final plague, the 10th plague, which is the Passover. And what do we see? Jesus is that Passover Lamb. He was the one that was presented on the 10th day of Abib. He is the one that was killed at even by the entire congregation. He was the one whose blood saves us. He was the one whose blood must be applied to the doorpost of our heart for us to be saved. And then when we're saved, we get baptized, right? And that's pictured by the children of Israel then crossing the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14, under the cloud, through the sea. Then when they get to the other side, what do they eat? Manna. Guess what? The manna represents Jesus. And we're going to get to that in a moment. The water that they drank represents Jesus. The manna that they ate, Jesus. I mean, look, it abounds. The whole book's about Jesus. You'd have to be blind not to see it, wouldn't you? It's everywhere. Now, if you would, if you're still in Exodus, look at Exodus 16, verse 35. They all ate the same spiritual meat. Exodus 16, 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna 
until they came under the borders of the land of Canaan. Flip over to chapter number 17, verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee, Exodus 17, 6, upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now let me show you that the manna is Jesus. Go, if you would, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. So baby Moses represents Jesus. The one who spake to Moses out of the burning bush was Jesus. The Passover lamb, Jesus. The one who's pouring out his wrath on Egypt, Jesus. Right? When they go through the, 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 uh, the, the Red Sea, it pictures baptism. Baptism has to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Then they get to the other side. They're in the wilderness. What do they eat? Manna. What do they drink? Water from the rock. The rock was Jesus. Well, now I'm going to show you that even the manna was Jesus. Okay? Look down at your Bible in John chapter 6, verse 30. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he giveth me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. Who do you think you are? You know, you're the bread that came down from heaven? Well, I wonder if he would have told him, you remember the rock that produced the water? Yeah, that was me. They wouldn't have believed that either, would they? But what did the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 10? They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, obviously, we know that that rock was not literally Jesus. Obviously, the rock is a picture of Jesus. Just like when Jesus holds up a piece of bread and says, this is my body, which is broken for you, it's called metaphor, okay? But Jesus is saying, look, I'm the bread they came down from heaven. Not because they were actually chewing up and swallowing Jesus when they chewed up and swallowed that manna. But what was the manna? What was it? Manna was bread that came down from heaven. It originated in heaven. It came down to the earth and it fed and nourished and kept them alive. It gave them life, right? They can't live without it. Now, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But we need water to live. We need bread to live. So Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. Why? Because I came down from heaven, just like the manna came down from heaven. And just as that manna was actually, you know, basically destroyed by their bodies. I mean, they broke it down and metabolized it and ate it. He's saying, look, my body's going to be broken for you. Okay, and I'm going to die for you to give you life just like the manna was consumed in order to give them nutrition and life. Just as the Passover was eaten, and the Passover represents Jesus, the manna was eaten, and the manna represents Jesus. So they murmured at this in verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. They're taking it too literally. When he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven, they're taking it too literally. They're like Nicodemus, you know, born again. So how can a man enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born? Now, that's a stupid question, right? By someone who's taking an overly literal interpretation of born again. Well, they're taking an overly literal interpretation of the bread of life and the manna and so forth. 
So it says here, the Jews murmured at him. Verse 42, and they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, that's a theme throughout Scripture, save he which is of God, that's talking about Jesus, the Son of God has seen him, he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Boy, underline that soul winning verse, huh? John 6, 47, that's a good one. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Again, they're too literal, right? How's he going to give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Well, sorry I offended you guys. Let me switch to a different illustration. Now he just digs in deeper. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me shall live by me. Now this is a key phrase. He that eateth me, he shall live by me. Why? Because the Bible said of the manna in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, He fed thee with manna, and he suffered thee to hunger, that thou mightest know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So they lived by manna. The manna pictured the word of God. The manna pictured Jesus because Jesus is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen? And so as they lived by manna, he's saying, you will live by me. Okay, so if you eat me, you'll live by me. Now look, he's not saying you physically take a bite, folks. And this is the foolishness of the Jews that he's preaching to, and it's the same foolishness of the Roman Catholics that want to give you a literal bread and a literal drink and say, you're literally, you're eating Jesus right now and you're drinking Jesus' blood right now. That's crazy. It's bizarre. It's symbolic. You say, prove it. Okay, he said, if you eat it, you'll never be hungry again. So are these Catholics just never hungry? Because they've eaten that bread, didn't they? I mean, didn't they go and eat the bread? They went and they got their little wafer and went through all that. And guess what? They're still hungry. Hey, they drank the juice and guess what? They're still thirsty. Guess what? It's not literal, okay? And the proof that it's not literal is found in verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what is it that actually needs to be eaten? It's not the literal physical flesh of Christ. Now he was going to literally give his flesh by dying on the cross, his body was broken. But what is actually eaten is the word of God. It's the word, right? What did the manna represent? The word. What did the manna represent? Jesus. Jesus is telling them, it's not the flesh that saves you. It's not the flesh that quickens you. It's the word. It's the spirit. The words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Why? Because in order to get saved, you have to eat God's word to be saved. The Bible says, thy words were found and I did eat them. You could go to four or five different scriptures on eating the word of God. Okay? When we read the Bible or hear the Bible, when we hear God's word, metaphorically, that's us eating God's word. That's our food, right? Give us this day our daily bread. We don't just live by physical bread alone. We also live by every word of God, right? God's word is our food. God's word feeds us, okay? So if we back up to where we were, 
He that eateth me shall live by me, verse 57. Verse 58 says, This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he decided to rethink his teaching. No, it says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Oh, does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit in their life, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So Jesus was like the manna in the sense that he came down from heaven, he sacrificed himself to give them life, just as the manna was consumed to give them physical life, and just as getting up every morning and picking up the manna and eating it pictured getting up every morning and picking up your Bible and reading it, it's the word of God that saves us. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. We're saved by the word of God. The word of God is whose entrance brings light unto us, right? We're quickened by God's word, the Bible says in Psalm 119. So there's a lot of symbolism of Jesus in Exodus, isn't there? There's a lot there. Now look, we're only in the first half of Exodus, what we've talked about so far, and most of the first half of Exodus is the story half. And then most of the second half of Exodus is the law and uh, Moses getting commandments from the mount and the building of the tabernacle and those type of things. And look, the time would fail me to tell you of all the parallels between that second half and Jesus. But I want to refer you to another sermon if you didn't hear this one, if you weren't there for this one. Back on August 5th of 2018, I preached a sermon called Symbolism of the Rapture in Exodus. And I deal with the second half of Exodus where Jesus' second coming in the rapture is pictured clearly in Exodus where there's a cloud and then the Lord comes down and the trumpet sounds. I mean, it's amazing how the rapture is just perfectly pictured in the book of Exodus. I did a whole sermon on that, so you, you could get the, the recording of that uh, symbolism of the rapture in Exodus. But of course, we've got other things like the bread, the, the show bread. You know, obviously Jesus is the bread of life, the, the candlestick. And the light, Jesus is the light of the world. All the different animal sacrifices, they all point to Jesus, who is the sacrifice for our sins. Of course, the high priest and all of his garments and the clothing that the high priest put on and the high priest being anointed and so forth, that's all a picture of Jesus Christ, the high priest who is the anointed. What does Christ even mean? Christ means Messiah. What does Messiah even mean? Messiah means anointed. That's why the Bible says against the Lord and against his anointed in Psalm 2. And it says against the Lord and against his Christ in Acts chapter 4, I believe, verse 26. So Christ, Messiah, and anointed all mean the same thing. Hey, the high priest is anointed in Exodus. That's about Jesus, our high priest, being anointed. When it talks about the Sabbath and the teaching in Exodus on the Sabbath, six days shalt thou labor. But the seventh day, the Sabbath, is holy unto you. You shall rest therein. You shall do no work therein. Hey, that's a picture of Jesus. Because in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. You know what the Sabbath represents? That God did all the work for salvation. And we are supposed to rest in the finished work of Christ. Just as God ceased from his works, we are to cease from our own works and trust in what Christ has already done. And so we see that throughout the book of Exodus, Jesus is present from start to finish in this book. This is a book all about Jesus Christ. Just as Genesis was, so is Exodus as well. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the book of Exodus, Lord. And most importantly, that it points us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to study, to show ourselves approved. Help us as we're reading Genesis, Exodus, and 
the rest of the Bible throughout this year, Lord. I pray that we would behold wondrous things out of your law and that we would understand that these books are not outdated or, or irrelevant, Lord, but help us to understand that they are very relevant and that they teach us about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen.